Our first lesson this morning is from 1 John 43 to 51. Please pray with me. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 1 John 43 through 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? When <clears throat> Philip came, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you come to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to them, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Our second reading this morning, as Libby indicated with the kids, comes from the Apostle Paul, his first letter to the church in Corinth, in the sixth chapter, beginning at verse... Well, I had it open to the wrong place. Beginning at verse 12 and continuing through the end of that chapter, listen for God's word to you this morning. All things are lawful to me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make the members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. In his book, The Undertaking, Poet and funeral director Thomas Lynch offers a series of life studies from his work in what he calls the dismal trade. His is a business of attending to the needs of the living and the bodies of the dead. 
He notes the difficulty the living so often have relating to dead bodies and the prevalence of what he calls the just a shell theory. It is proffered, he says, as comfort in the teeth of a comfortless situation, consolation to the inconsolable. It's okay, someone is bound to say. That's not her, it's just a shell. Lynch recalls an Episcopal deacon who was nearly decked by the swift slap of the mother of a teenager dead of leukemia to whom he'd given such counsel. I'll tell you when it's just a shell, the woman said. For now and until I tell you otherwise, she's my daughter. But it isn't just dead bodies that the living have such difficulty with. It's all bodies except a select few that are usually not our own. And whether we do so consciously or not, this difficulty leads us to regard our own bodies and those of others as both problematic and secondary to who we really are. We fall into the trap of what is often called body-mind or body-spirit duality. One of my favorite expressions of this comes in the film The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. The movie is an adaptation of a set of tall tales surrounding a fictitious German nobleman who at one point is catapulted by a cannonball to the moon, where he encounters his old friend, the King of the Moon, or at least his head, anyway. As the king explains to the baron, that is where all the brilliant and important parts of him are. When he catches sight of his headless body harassing the queen, he calls his body revolting. It's hard to believe my body and I were ever attached, he explains. We are so totally incompatible. It reminds me of a teacher I had when I was in the Conservatory Musical Theater program at Carnegie Mellon. Her name was Victoria Santa Cruz, and she was this black Peruvian woman who taught a course called simply Rhythm. Now, this wasn't a class about music or music theory. Victoria Santa Cruz was on the acting faculty, even though in that particular class we never did anything that would be considered scene study. Instead, what we often did was sit in a circle while she created a beat with the drum machine that she used for the class. And there were a variety of games, as she liked to call them, that we were to take part in as we responded to the rhythms that she created. We were, however, forbidden to practice these games outside of class. The point, she said, was not to perfect the game, but to listen and enter into the rhythm of what we were being asked to do. And we failed far more than we ever succeeded in that class doing what she was asking us to do. And she would scream at us with her displeasure. By far her greatest complaint was that we listened with our heads and not with our bodies. I keyed, she would exclaim. You are living on the fifth floor. You need to get into the basement. (laughs) Years later, I have come to recognize that this isn't just a problem for actors, but for all kinds of Western educated people who have been steeped in the same kind of body-mind dualism that caused the king of the moon to regard his own body as not only revolting, but as something with which he was totally incompatible. The irony of this kind of disregard for our bodies has a very real and detrimental spiritual consequences. It turns out they aren't so separate after all. That's what Paul is up against with the Christians living in Corinth, and it's what we're still up against today. The Christians in Corinth have two problems, really. The first is that they have taken Paul's words about the law so completely to heart that they believe themselves to be above it. All things are lawful to me is the first century equivalent to the person who says, hey, 
it's a free country. As though those words magically excuse and entitle a person to do whatever they want without consequence. All things are lawful, concedes Paul. It is a free country, we might echo, but not everything is beneficial. We can abuse the freedom we enjoy to the detriment of those around us until we're not free at all, but simply dominated by the whims of our own desires or appetites. The heart may want what the heart wants, but that doesn't always mean that the heart knows what is best for itself, or more importantly, what is best for those around it. As much as we might revel in the myth of American independence or the fallacy of the self-made person, the truth that Paul would have us see is that we, and this includes our bodies, are not our own. And because we do not belong to ourselves, the highest good for a human person is not self-satisfaction. Instead, we belong entirely to God, so our highest good is found beyond ourselves. The second problem that the Christians in Corinth have is that the prevailing wisdom of the culture that they live in is that the body is a thing outside of themselves. It's an inconvenience and encumbrance, and certainly it has nothing to do with who they are in the purest sense. This is our inheritance from the Greeks. The body is just a shell, merely a vehicle for our real selves, our immortal souls. That, the the notion of an immortal soul, is a decidedly unbiblical idea. It not only runs against the language of our morning psalm, which talks about God knitting us together in our mother's wombs and describes us as fearfully and wonderfully made, it also contradicts the very thing we just got done celebrating at Christmas. That God would come down and become incarnate. Would take on a human body, one that enters the world in naked, helpless vulnerability, and one that breathes its last in the exact same state. The Christian faith is one that is embodied. One that trusts that we encounter and participate in what God is doing with our bodies. That's the conclusion of our oldest creed. We don't talk about going to heaven when we die or profess belief in the immortality of the soul. We say, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Everlasting life isn't like the king of the moon floating around without a body. Everlasting life follows directly from our experience of bodily resurrection. All of that is to say that bodies matter. But more than that, bodies are sacred. (coughs) And they are holy in all their forms and abilities. It isn't the physical perfection we've been conditioned to seek that makes them holy. It isn't their relative thinness or thickness. It isn't their lightness or heaviness. It isn't their shape or size, strength or weakness, speed or slowness. It isn't their health or sickness that determines such holiness. It certainly isn't a function of the lightness or darkness of their skin. In fact, It's safe to say that every criteria that we employ to determine the worth and value of a human body have nothing to do with its holiness. Just as Jesus' own body becomes the means by which God dwelt with us, so now our bodies, following in the way of Jesus, assume that same function. The body is meant for the Lord, Paul writes to the church. The body, 
Our bodies are the place where God takes up residence with us. Our bodies are the living, breathing, physical manifestation of Christ resurrected, not just within us, but among us and to the rest of the world. And that means that not only do our bodies themselves matter and have value and worth far beyond what any magazine would try to tell us, but what we do with those bodies matters too. That's what our friend Glennon Doyle, who was here over a year ago, tried to teach her 10-year-old daughter, Tish, the day she told her mom, Mama, the other girls are skinny. Why am I different? And Glennon did her best to talk about how hard and wonderful it is to have a body. And then one night they were at a bookstore, and on the way out, her daughter stopped at the magazine rack. She stood in front of a rack made up of seven covers, Glennon writes. Covers that all displayed pictures of women, each blonder and more emaciated than the last, each angrier and more objectified than the one before. Those magazine covers held up a certain type of pretend woman for all to see as the pinnacle of female achievement. So she went and she picked up a magazine and they looked at it together. Tish, she asked her daughter, what do you think women's bodies are for? And her daughter answered, writing? Running? Hugging? And Glennon said, are women's bodies for selling things? Her daughter said, no. Paul would add that our bodies are for glorifying God. As well and good as it is to believe with our minds and to seek an intellectual understanding of just what all of this means, ultimately we need to stop living on the fifth floor and get into the basement. We need to come to the full bodily awareness of who we are as those who are made, both women and men alike, in the image and likeness of God. Which means that not only do we carry that image around with us everywhere we go, but so does everyone else. When we talk about justice, And generous love, those are not just ideas in the abstract. Those are words that have to mean something for actual living, breathing human bodies, or they mean nothing at all. This weekend, we are celebrating the holiday dedicated to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. because of his work towards civil rights and the full inclusion of all people, particularly people of color, in the life of this country. We celebrate him now, but there were plenty who vilified him back then, accused him of being a communist, accused him of being divisive for calling attention to the worth and value of black bodies, that even after the passage of the 13th Amendment outlawing slavery, were still treated as something dangerous and dishonorable instead of as the sacred vessels of the Holy Spirit that they are. People didn't like Dr. King for confronting them with this problem. They didn't want to change or consider that those bodies bore God's image just as much as their own. But it's important to remember that while such work may have political implications, the word politics is just Greek for the people. And the people are made up of bodies. And those bodies are nothing less than the dwelling place of the Almighty God. To advocate for civil rights or to speak out insistently and persistently against racism or to advocate on behalf of all the people whose bodies are still so regularly abused and discarded is precisely how we fulfill this scripture. 
To do so is to recognize that both our own bodies and others are not our own. They belong to God. And to glorify God in our bodies is to treat every body as the place where the very image and spirit of God continue to dwell. Hallelujah. Amen. Would you stand as together we say what we believe using the words from the letter to the church in Colossae, our affirmation of faith printed in your bulletins. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Amen.